had been in the background from the first with open mouth and eyes, which, staring and gaping features, were not diminished in breadth by the untimely suppression of the subject. However, no more was said about it, though much appeared to be thought on all sides, by no means excepting the two young Cornishes who partook of the evening meal as if their eating the bread and butter were rendered almost superfluous by the painful probability of the worst of men shortly presenting himself for the purpose of eating them. Mr. Baptiste, by degrees, began to chirp a little, but never stirred from the seat he had taken behind the door and close to the window, though it was not his usual place. As often as the little bell rang, he started and peeped out secretly, with the end of the little curtain in his hand and the rest before his face, evidently not at all satisfied, but that the man he dreaded had tracked him through all his doublings and turnings with the certainty of a terrible bloodhound. The entrance at various times of two or three customers and of Mr. Plornish gave Mr. Baptiste just enough of this employment to keep the attention of the company fixed upon him. Tea was over and the children were abed, and Mrs. Plornish was feeling her way to the dutiful proposal that her father should favour them with Chloe when the bell rang again and Mr. Clennam came in. Clennam had been poring late over his books and letters, for the waiting rooms of the circumlocution office ravaged his time sorely. Over and above that, he was depressed and made uneasy by the late occurrence at his mother's. He looked worn and solitary. He felt so too, but nevertheless was returning home from his counting-house by that end of the yard to give them the intelligence that he had received another letter from Miss Dorrit. The news made a sensation in the cottage, which drew off the general attention from Mr. Baptiste. Maggie, who pushed her way into the foreground immediately, would have seemed to draw in the tidings of her little mother equally at her ears, nose, mouth, and eyes, but that the last were obstructed by tears. She was particularly delighted when Clennam assured her that there were hospitals and very kindly conducted hospitals in Rome. Mr. Panks rose into new distinction in virtue of being specially remembered in the letter. Everybody was pleased and interested, and Clennam was well repaid for his trouble. "'But you are tired, sir. Let me make you a cup of tea,' said Mrs. Plornish. "'If you'd condescend to take such a thing in the cottage, and many thanks to you too, I am sure, for bearing us in mind so kindly.' Mr. Plornish, deeming it incumbent on him as host to add his personal acknowledgments, tendered them in the form which always expressed his highest ideal of a combination of ceremony with sincerity. "'John Edward Nandy,' said Mr. Plornish, addressing the old gentleman, "'Sir, it's not too often that you see unpretending actions without a spark of pride, and therefore when you see them give grateful honour unto the same, being that if you don't and live to want them, it follows serve you right.' To which Mr. Nandy replied, I am heartily of your opinion, Thomas, and which your opinion is the same as mine, and therefore no more words, and not being backwards with that opinion, which opinion giving it as yes, Thomas, yes, is the opinion in which yourself and me must ever be unanimously joined by all, and where there is not difference of opinion, there can be none but one opinion, which fully no, Thomas, Thomas, no. Arthur with less formality, expressed himself gratified by their high appreciation of so very slight an attention on his part, and explained as to the tea that he had not yet dined, and was going straight home to refresh after a long day's labour, or he would have readily accepted the hospitable offer. As Mr. Panks was somewhat noisily getting his steam up for departure, he concluded by asking that gentleman if he would walk with him. Mr. Pank said he desired no better engagement, and the two took leave of Happy Cottage. "'If you will come home with me, Panks,' said Arthur, when they got into the street, "'and will share what dinner or supper there is, it will be next door to an act of charity, for I am weary and out of sorts to-night.' "'Ask me to do a greater thing than that,' said Panks, "'when you want it done, and I'll do it.' Between this eccentric personage and Clennam, a tacit understanding and accord had been always improving since Mr. Panks flew over Mr. Rugg's back in the Marshalsea yard. When the carriage drove away on the memorable day of the family's departure, these two had looked after it together and had walked slowly away together. 
When the first letter came from Little Dorrit, nobody was more interested in hearing of her than Mr. Panks. The second letter, at that moment in Clennam's breast pocket, particularly remembered him by name. Though he had never before made any profession nor protestation to Clennam, and though what he had just said was little enough as to the words in which it was expressed, Clennam had long had a growing belief that Mr. Panks, in his own odd way, was becoming attached to him. All these things intertwining made Panks a very cable of anchorage that night. I'm quite alone, Arthur explained as they walked on. My partner is away, busily engaged at a distance on his branch of our business, and you shall do just as you like. Thank you. You didn't take particular notice of little outro just now, did you? said Panks. No, why? He's a bright fellow and I like him, said Panks. Something has gone amiss with him today. Have you any idea of any cause that can have overset him? You surprise me. None whatever. Mr. Panks gave his reasons for the inquiry. Arthur was quite unprepared for them and quite unable to suggest an explanation of them. Perhaps you'll ask him, said Panks, as he's a stranger. Ask him what, returned Clennam, what he has on his mind. I ought first to see for myself that he has something on his mind, I think, said Clennam. I have found him in every way so diligent, so grateful for little enough, and so trustworthy that it might look like suspecting him, and that would be very unjust. True, said Banks, but I say, you oughtn't to be anybody's proprietor, Mr. Clennam. You're much too delicate. For the matter of that, returned Clennam, laughing, I have not a large proprietary share in Cavalletto. His carving is his livelihood. He keeps the keys of the factory, watches it every alternate night, and acts as a sort of housekeeper to it generally, but we have little work in the way of his ingenuity, though we give him what we have. No, I am rather his adviser than his proprietor. To call me his standing counsel and his banker would be nearer the fact. Speaking of being his banker, is it not curious, Panks, that the ventures which run just now in so many people's heads should run even in little cavalletto's? Ventures, retorted Panks with a snort. What ventures? These Myrtle enterprises. Oh, investments, said Panks. Aye, aye, I didn't know you were speaking of investments. His quick way of replying caused Lenham to look at him with a doubt whether he meant more than he said. As it was accompanied, however, with a quickening of his pace and a corresponding increase in the labouring of his machinery, Arthur did not pursue the matter, and they soon arrived at his house. A dinner of soup and a pigeon pie served on a little round table before the fire, and flavoured with a bottle of good wine, oiled Mr. Pank's works in a highly effective manner, so that when Clennam produced his eastern pipe, and handed Mr. Panks another eastern pipe. The latter gentleman was perfectly comfortable. They puffed for a while in silence. Mr. Panks, like a steam vessel with a wind, tide, calm water, and all other sea-going conditions in her favour. He was the first to speak, and he spoke thus. Yes, investments is the word. Clennam, with his former look, said, Ah, I'm going back to it, you see, said Panks. Yes, I see you are going back to it, returned Clennam, wondering why. Wasn't it a curious thing that they should run in little Altro's head, eh? said Panks as he smoked. Wasn't that how you put it? That was what I said. Aye, but think of the whole yard having got it. Think of their all meeting me with it, on my collecting days, here and there and everywhere, whether they pay or whether they don't pay. Myrtle, 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 always Myrtle. Very strange how these runs on an infatuation prevail, said Arthur. Aren't it? returned Panks. After smoking for a minute or so, more dryly than comported, with his recent oiling, he added, Because, you see, these people don't understand the subject. Not a bit, assented Clennam. Not a bit, cried Panks. Know nothing of figures, know nothing of money questions, never made a calculation, never worked it, sir. If they had, Clennam was going on to say, when Mr. Panks, without change of countenance, produced a sound so far surpassing all his usual efforts, nasal or bronchial, that he stopped. If they had, repeated Panks in an inquiring tone. I thought you spoke, said Arthur, hesitating what name to give the interruption. Not at all, 
said Banks. Not yet. I may in a minute. If they had... If they had, observed Lenham, who was a little at a loss how to take his friend, why, I suppose they would have known better. How so, Mr. Glenham? Banks asked quickly, and with an odd effect of having been from the commencement of the conversation loaded with the heavy charge he now fired off. They're right, you know. They don't mean to be, but they're right. Right in sharing Cavaletto's inclination to speculate with Mr. Myrtle? Perfectly, sir, said Banks. I've gone into it. I've made the calculations. I've worked it. They're safe and genuine. Relieved by having got to this, Mr. Panks took as long a pull as his lungs would permit at his eastern pipe, and looked sagaciously and steadily at Clenham while inhaling and exhaling too. In those moments Mr. Panks began to give out the dangerous infection with which he was laden. It is the manner of communicating these diseases, it is the subtle way in which they go about. Do you mean, my good Panks, asked Clenham emphatically, that you would put that thousand pounds of yours, let us say, for instance, out at this kind of interest? Certainly, said Panks. Already done it, sir. Mr. Panks took another long inhalation, another long exhalation, another long sagacious look at Clenham. I tell you, Mr. Clenham, I've gone into it, said Panks. He's a man of immense resources, enormous capital, government influence. They're the best schemes afloat. They're safe. They're certain. Well, returned Clenham, looking first at him gravely and then at the fire gravely, you surprise me. Bah, Hanks retorted. Don't say that, sir. It's what you ought to do yourself. Why don't you do as I do? Of whom Mr. Panks had taken the prevalent disease, he could no more have told than if he had unconsciously taken a fever. Bred at first, as many physical diseases are, in the wickedness of men and then disseminated in their ignorance, these epidemics, after a period, get communicated to many sufferers who are neither ignorant nor wicked. Mr. Panks might or might not have caught the illness himself from a subject of this class, but in this category he appeared before Clenham, and the infection he threw off was all the more virulent. And you really have invested? Clenham had already passed to that word, your thousand pounds, Panks? To be sure, sir, replied Panks boldly, with a puff of smoke, and only wish it ten. Now Clenham had two subjects lying heavy on his lonely mind that night. The one, his partner's long-deferred hope, the other, what he had seen and heard at his mother's. In the relief of having this companion, and of feeling that he could trust him, he passed on to both, and both brought him round again, with an increase and acceleration of force to his point of departure. It came about in the simplest manner. Quitting the investment subject, after an interval of silent looking at the fire through the smoke of his pipe, he told Panks how and why he was occupied with the great national department. A hard case it has been, and a hard case it is on Doyce, he finished by saying, with all the honest feeling the topic roused in him. Hard indeed, Panks acquiesced. But you manage for them, Mr. Clenham? How do you mean? Manage the money part of the business? Yes, as well as I can. Manage it better, sir, said Panks. Recompense him for his toils and disappointments. Give him the chances of the time. He'll never benefit himself in that way, patient and preoccupied workman. He looks to you, sir. I do my best, Panks, returned Clenham uneasily. As to duly weighing and considering these new enterprises of which I have had no experience, I doubt if I am fit for it. I'm growing old. Growing old? cried Panks. <laughs> there was something so undutably genuine in the wonderful laugh, and series of snorts and puffs engendered in Mr. Panks' astonishment at, and utter rejection of, the idea that his being quite in earnest could not be questioned. Growing old? cried Panks. Hear, hear, hear. Old, hear him, hear him. The positive refusal expressed in Mr. Panks' continued snorts, no less than in these exclamations, to entertain the sentiment for a single instant, drove Arthur away from it. Indeed, he was fearful of something happening to Mr. Panks in the violent conflict that took place between the breath he jerked out of himself and the smoke he jerked into himself. 
This abandonment of the second topic threw him on the third. Young, old, or middle-aged, thanks, he said, when there was a favourable pause. I am in a very anxious and uncertain state, a state that even leads me to doubt whether anything now seeming to belong to me may be really mine. Shall I tell you how this is? Shall I put a great trust in you? You shall, sir, said Panks, if you believe me worthy of it. I do. You may, Mr. Panks, short and sharp rejoinder, confirmed by the sudden outstretching of his coaly hand, was most expressive and convincing. Arthur shook the hand warmly. He then, softening the approach of his old apprehensions as much as was possible consistently with their being made intelligible and never alluding to his mother by name, but speaking vaguely of a relation of his, confided to Mr. Panks a broad outline of the misgivings he entertained and of the interview he had witnessed. Mr. Panks listened with such earnest that, regardless of the charms of the eastern pipe, he put it in the grate among the fire-irons, and occupied his hands during the whole recital in so erecting the loops and hooks of hair all over his head, that he looked, when it came to a conclusion, like a journeyman hamlet in conversation with his father's spirit. "'Brings me back, sir,' was his exclamation then, with a startling touch on Clenham's knee. "'Brings me back, sir, to the investments. I don't say anything of your making yourself poor to repair a wrong you never committed.' That's you, a man must be himself. But I say this, fearing you may want money to save your own blood from exposure and disgrace, make as much as you can. Arthur shook his head, but looked at him thoughtfully too. Be as rich as you can, sir, Hanks adjured him, with a powerful concentration of all his energies on the advice. Be as rich as you honestly can. It's your duty, not for your sake, but for the sake of others. Take time by the forelock. Poor oh, Mr. Doyce, who really is growing old, depends upon you. Your relative depends upon you. You don't know what depends upon you. Well, 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 returned Arthur. Enough for tonight. One word more, Mr. Clennam, retorted Panks, and then enough for tonight. Why should you leave all the gains to the gluttons, knaves and impostors? Why should you leave all the gains that are to be got to my proprietor and the like of him? Yet you're always doing it. When I say you, I mean such men as you. You know you are. Why, I see it every day of my life. I see nothing else. It's my business to see it. Therefore I say, urged Panks, go in and win. But what of go in and lose? said Arthur. Can't be done, sir, returned Panks. I've looked into it. Name up everywhere, immense resources, enormous capital, great position, high connection, government influence. Can't be done. Gradually, after this closing exposition, Mr. Pank subsided, allowed his hair to droop as much as it ever would droop on the utmost persuasion, reclaimed the pipe from the fire-irons, filled it anew, and smoked it out. They said little more, but were company to one another in silently pursuing the same subjects, and did not part until midnight. On taking his leave, Mr. Panks, when he had shaken hands with Clennam, worked completely round him before he steamed out at the door. This Arthur received as an assurance that he might implicitly rely on Panks, if he ever should come to need assistance, either in any of the matters of which they had spoken that night, or any other subject that could in any way affect himself. At intervals all next day, and even while his attention was fixed on other things, he thought of Mr. Panks's investment of his thousand pounds, and of his having looked into it. He thought of Mr. Panks's being so sanguine in this matter, and of his not being usually of a sanguine character. He thought of the great national department, and of the delight it would be to him to see Doyce better off. He thought of the darkly threatening place that went by the name of home in his remembrance, and of the gathering shadows which made it yet more darkly threatening than of old. He observed anew that whenever he went he saw or heard or touched the celebrated name of Myrtle. He found it difficult even to remain at his desk a couple of hours without having it presented to one of his bodily senses through some agency or other. He began to think it was curious, too, that it should be everywhere, and that everybody but he should seem to have 
any mistrust of it. Though indeed he began to remember, when he got to this, even he did not mistrust it. He had only happened to keep aloof from it. Such symptoms, when a disease of the kind is rife, are usually the signs of sickening. Chapter 14 Taking Advice When it became known to the Britons on the shore of the Yellow Tiber that their intelligent compatriot, Mr. Sparkler, was made one of the lords of their circumlocution office, they took it as a piece of news with which they had no nearer concern than with any other piece of news, any other accident or offence in the English papers. Some laughed, some said, by way of complete excuse, that the post was virtually a sinecure, and any fool who could spell his name was good enough for it. Some, and these the more solemn political oracles, said that Decimus did wisely to strengthen himself, and that the sole constitutional purpose of all places within the gift of Decimus was that Decimus should strengthen himself. A few bilious Britons there were who would not subscribe to this article of faith, but their objection was purely theoretical. In a practical point of view, they listlessly abandoned the matter as being the business of some other Britons unknown, somewhere or nowhere. In like manner, at home, great numbers of Britons maintained, for as long as four and twenty consecutive hours, that those invisible and anonymous Britons ought to take it up, and that if they quietly acquiesced in it, they deserved it. But of what class the remiss Britons were composed, and where the unlucky creatures hid themselves, and why they hid themselves, and how it constantly happened that they neglected their interests when so many other Britons were quite at a loss to account for their not looking after those interests, was not, either upon the shore of the Yellow Tiber or the shore of the Black Thames, made apparent to men. Mrs. Myrtle circulated the news as she received congratulations on it with a careless grace that displayed it to advantage as the setting displays the jewel. Yes, she said, Edmund had taken the place. Mr. Myrtle wished him to take it, and he had taken it. She hoped Edmund might like it, but really she didn't know. It would keep him in town a good deal, and he preferred the country. Still, it was not a disagreeable position, and it was a position. There was no denying that the thing was a compliment to Mr. Myrtle, and was not a bad thing for Edmund if he liked it. It was just as well that he should have something to do, and it was just as well that he should have something for doing it. Whether it would be more agreeable to Edmund than the army remained to be seen. Thus the bosom, accomplished in the art of seeming to make things of small account, and really enhancing them in the process. While Henry Gowan, whom Decimus had thrown away, went through the whole round of his acquaintance between the gates of the people and the town of Albano, vowing almost but not quite with tears in his eyes that Sparkler was the sweetest-tempered, simplest-hearted, altogether most lovable jackass that ever grazed on the public common, and that only one circumstance could have delighted him, Gowan, more than his, the beloved jackasses, getting this post, and that would have been his, Gowan's, getting it himself. He said it was the very thing for Sparkler. There was nothing to do, and he would do it charmingly. There was a handsome salary to draw, and he would draw it charmingly. It was a delightful, appropriate, capital appointment, and he almost forgave the donor his slight of himself, in his joy that the dear donkey, for whom he had so great an affection, was so admirably stabled. Nor did his benevolence stop here. He took pains, on all social occasions, to draw Mr. Sparkler out and make him conspicuous before the company, and, although the considerate action always resulted in that young gentleman's making a dreary and forlorn mental spectacle of himself, the friendly intention was not to be doubted. Unless, indeed, it chanced to be doubted by the object of Mr. Sparkler's affections. Miss Fanny was now in the difficult situation of being universally known in that light, and of not having dismissed Mr. Sparkler, however capriciously she used him. Hence, she was sufficiently identified with the gentleman to feel compromised by his being more than usually ridiculous, and hence, being by no means deficient in quickness, she sometimes came to his rescue against Gowan, and did him very good service.'
But while doing this, she was ashamed of him, undetermined whether to get rid of him or more decidedly encourage him, distracted with apprehensions that she was every day becoming more and more enmeshed in her uncertainties and tortured by misgivings that Mrs. Myrtle triumphed in her distress. With this tumult in her mind, it is no subject for surprise that Miss Fanny came home one night in a state of agitation from a concert and ball at Mrs. Myrtle's house, and on her sister affectionately trying to soothe her, pushed that sister away from the toilet table at which she sat angrily trying to cry, and declared with a heaving bosom that she detested everybody and she wished she was dead. Dear Fanny, what is the matter? Tell me. Matter, you little mole? said Fanny. If you were not the blindest of the blind, you would have no occasion to ask me. The idea of daring to pretend to assert that you have eyes in your head and yet ask me what's the matter? Is it Mr. Sparkler, dear? Mr. Sparkler, repeated Fanny, with unbounded scorn, as if he were the last subject in the solar system that could possibly be near her mind. No, Miss Bat, it is not. Immediately afterwards she became remorseful for having called her sister names, declaring with sobs that she knew she made herself hateful, but that everybody drove her to it. "'I don't think you are well tonight, dear Fanny.' "'Stuff and nonsense,' replied the young lady, turning angry again. "'I am as well as you are. Perhaps I might say better, and yet make no boast of it.' "'Poor little Dorrit!' not seeing her way to the offering of any soothing words that would escape repudiation, deemed it best to remain quiet. At first, Fanny took this ill, too, protesting to her looking-glass that of all the trying sisters a girl could have, she did think the most trying sister was a flat sister, that she knew she was at times a wretched temper, that she knew she made herself hateful, that when she made herself hateful nothing would do her half the good as being told so, but that, being afflicted with a flat sister, she never was told so, and the consequence resulted that she was absolutely tempted and goaded into making herself disagreeable. Besides, she angrily told her looking-glass, she didn't want to be forgiven. It was not a right example that she should be constantly stooping to be forgiven by a younger sister. And this was the art of it, that she was always being placed in the position of being forgiven, whether she liked it or not. Finally, she burst into violent weeping, and when her sister came and sat close at her side to comfort her, said, Amy, you're an angel. But I tell you what, my pet, said Fanny, when her sister's gentleness had calmed her, it now comes to this, that things cannot and shall not go on as they are at present going on, and that there must be an end of this, one way or another. As the announcement was vague, though very peremptory, little Dorrit returned, let us talk about it. Quite so, my dear, assented Fanny, as she dried her eyes. Let us talk about it. I am rational again now, and you shall advise me. Will you advise me, my sweet child? Even Amy smiled at this notion, but she said, I will, Fanny, as well as I can. Thank you, dearest Amy, returned Fanny, kissing her. You are my anchor. Having embraced her anchor with great affection, Fanny took a bottle of sweet toilette water from the table and called to her maid for a fine handkerchief. She then dismissed that attendant for the night and went on to be advised, dabbing her eyes and forehead from time to time to cool them. My love, Fanny began, our characters and points of view are sufficiently different, kiss me again, my darling, to make it very probable that I shall surprise you by what I am going to say. What I am going to say, my dear, is that notwithstanding our property, we labour, socially speaking, under disadvantages. You don't quite understand what I mean, Amy. I have no doubt I shall, said Amy mildly, after a few words more. Well, my dear, what I mean is that we are, after all, newcomers into fashionable life. I am sure, Fanny, little Dorrit interposed in her zealous admiration, no one needs find that out in you. Well, my dear child, perhaps not said Fanny, though it's most kind and most affectionate in you, you precious girl, to say so. Here she dabbed her sister's forehead and blew upon it a little. But you are, resumed Fanny, as is well known the dearest little thing that ever was. To resume, my child. Pa is extremely gentlemanly and extremely well informed, but he is, in some trifling respects, 
a little different from other gentlemen of his fortune, partly on account of what he has gone through. Poor dear! Partly, I fancy, on account of its often running in his mind that other people are thinking about that, while he is talking to them. Uncle, my love, is altogether unpresentable. Though a dear creature to whom I am tenderly attached, he is, socially speaking, shocking. Edward is frightfully expensive and dissipated. I don't mean that there is anything ungenteel in that itself, far from it, but I do mean that he doesn't do it well, and that he doesn't, if I may so express myself, get the money's worth in the sort of dissipated reputation that attaches to him. Poor Edward, sighed little Dorrit, with the whole family history in the sigh. Yes, and poor you and me too, returned Fanny rather sharply. Very true. Then, my dear, we have no mother, and we have a Mrs. General. And I tell you again, darling, that Mrs. General, if I may reverse a common proverb and adapt it to her, is a cat in gloves who will catch mice. That woman, I am quite sure and confident, will be our mother-in-law. I can hardly think, Fanny. Fanny stopped her. Now, don't argue with me about it, Amy, said she, because I know better. Feeling that she had been sharp again, she dabbed her sister's forehead again and blew upon it again. To resume once more, my dear, it then becomes a question with me. I am proud and spirited, Amy, as you very well know, too much so, I dare say, whether I shall make up my mind to take it upon myself to carry the family through. How? asked her sister anxiously. I will not, said Fanny, without answering the question, submit to be mother-in-law by Mrs. General, and I will not submit to be, in any respect whatever, either patronised or tormented by Mrs. Myrtle. Little Dorrit laid her hand upon the hand that held the bottle of sweet water with a still more anxious look. Fanny, quite punishing her own forehead with the vehement dab she now began to give it, fitfully went on. That he has somehow or other, and how is of no consequence, attained a very good position no one can deny, that it is a very good connection no one can deny, and as to the question of clever or not clever, I doubt very much whether a clever husband would be suitable to me. I cannot submit. I should not be able to defer to him enough. Oh, my dear Fanny, expostulated little Dorrit, upon whom a kind of terror had been stealing as she perceived what her sister meant. If you loved anyone, all this feeling would change. If you loved anyone, you would no more be yourself, but you would quite lose and forget yourself in your devotion to him. If you loved him, Fanny— Fanny had stopped the dabbing hand, and was looking at her fixedly. "'Oh, indeed!' cried Fanny. "'Really, bless me, how much some people know of some subjects. They say everyone has a subject, and I certainly seem to have hit upon yours, Amy. There, you little thing, I was only in fun.' dabbing her sister's forehead. But don't you be a silly puss, and don't you think flightily and eloquently about degenerate impossibilities. There. Now, I'll go back to myself. Dear Fanny, let me say first that I would far rather we worked for a scanty living again than I would see you rich and married to Mr. Sparkler. Let you say, my dear? retorted Fanny. Why, of course I will let you say anything. There is no constraint upon you, I hope. We are together to talk it over, and as to marrying Mr. Sparkler, I have not the slightest intention of doing so tonight, my dear, or tomorrow morning either. But at some time? At no time, for anything I know at present, answered Fanny, with indifference. Then, suddenly changing her indifference into a burning restlessness, she added, You talk about the clever men, you little thing. It's all very fine and easy to talk about the clever men, but where are they? I don't see them anywhere near me. My dear Fanny, so short a time. Short time or long time, interrupted Fanny. I am impatient of our situation. I don't like our situation, and very little would induce me to change it. Other girls, differently reared and differently circumstanced altogether, might wonder at what I say or may do. Let them. They are driven by their lives and characters. I am driven by mine. Fanny, my dear Fanny, you know that you have qualities to make you the wife of one very superior to Mr. Sparkler. Amy, my dear Amy, retorted Fanny, parodying her words, 
I know that I wish to have a more defined and distinct position, in which I can assert myself with greater effect against that insolent woman. Would you therefore, forgive my asking, Fanny, therefore marry her son? Why, perhaps, said Fanny, with a triumphant smile, there may be many less promising ways of arriving at an end than that, my dear. That piece of insolence may think now that it would be a great success to get her son off upon me and shelve me, but perhaps she little thinks how I would retort upon her if I married her son. I would oppose her in everything and compete with her. I would make it the business of my life. Fanny set down the bottle when she came to this and walked about the room, always stopping and standing still while she spoke. One thing I would certainly do, my child, I could make her older, and I would. This was followed by another walk. I would talk of her as an old woman. I would pretend to know, if I didn't, but I should from her son all about her age. And she should hear me say, Amy, affectionately, quite dutifully and affectionately, how well she looked, considering her time of life. I could make her seem older at once, by being myself so much younger. I may not be as handsome as she is. I am not a fair judge of that question, I suppose, but I know I am handsome enough to be a thorn in her side, and I would be. My dear sister, would you condemn yourself to an unhappy life for this? It wouldn't be an unhappy life, Amy. It would be the life I am fitted for. Whether by disposition or whether by circumstance is no matter. I am better fitted for such a life than for almost any other. There was something of a desolate tone in those words, but with a short, proud laugh she took another walk, and after passing a great looking-glass came to another stop. Figure? Figure, Amy? Well, the woman has a good figure, I will give her her due, and not deny it. But is it so far beyond all others that it is altogether unapproachable? Upon my word, I am not so sure of it. Give some much younger woman the latitude as to dress that she has, being married, and we would see about that, my dear. Something in the thought that was agreeable and flattering brought her back to her seat in a gayer temper. She took her sister's hands in hers and clapped all four hands above her head as she looked in her sister's face, laughing. And the dancer, Amy, that she has quite forgotten, the dancer who bore no sort of resemblance to me and of whom I never remind her, oh dear no, should dance through her life and dance in a way to such a tune as would disturb her insolent placidity a little, just a little, my dear Amy, just a little. Meeting an earnest and imploring look in Amy's face, she brought the four hands down and laid only one on Amy's lips. Now, don't argue with me, child, she said in a sterner way, because it is of no use. I understand these subjects much better than you do. I have not nearly made up my mind, but it may be. Now we have talked this over comfortably and may go to bed. You best and dearest little mouse, good night. With those words Fanny weighed her anchor, and having taken so much advice, left off being advised for that occasion. Thenceforward, Amy observed Mr. Sparkler's treatment by his enslaver, with new reasons for attaching importance to all that passed between them. There were times when Fanny appeared quite unable to endure his mental feebleness, and when she became so sharply impatient of it, she would all but dismiss him for good. There were other times when she got on much better with him, when he amused her, and when her sense of superiority seemed to counterbalance that opposite side of the scale. If Mr. Sparkler had been other than the faithfulest and most submissive of swains, he was sufficiently hard-pressed to have fled from the scene of his trials, and have set at least the whole distance from Rome to London between himself and his enchantress. But he had no greater will of his own than a boat has when it is towed by a steamship, and he followed his cruel mistress through rough and smooth on equally strong compulsion. Mrs. Myrtle, during these passages, said little to Fanny, but said more about her. She was, as it were, forced to look at her through her eyeglass and in general conversation to allow commendations of her beauty to be wrung from her by its irresistible demands. The defiant character it assumed, when Fanny heard these extollings, as it generally happened that she did, was not expressive of concessions to the impartial bosom, but the utmost revenge the bosom took was, to say audibly, a spoilt beauty 
but with that face and shape, who could wonder? It might have been about a month or six weeks after the night of the new advice, when Little Dorrit began to think she detected some new understanding between Mr. Sparkler and Fanny. Mr. Sparkler, as if in attendance to some compact, scarcely ever spoke without first looking towards Fanny for leave. That young lady was too discreet ever to look back again, but if Mr. Sparkler had permission to speak, she remained silent. If he had not, she herself spoke. Moreover, it became plain whenever Henry Gowan attempted to perform the friendly office of drawing him out, that he was not to be drawn. And not only that, but Fanny would presently, without any pointed application in the world, chance to say something with such a sting in it that Gowan would draw back as if he had put his hand into a beehive. There was yet another circumstance which went a long way to confirm Little Dorrit in her fears, though it was not a great circumstance in itself. Mr. Sparkler's demeanour towards herself changed. It became fraternal. Sometimes, when she was in the outer circle of assemblies, at their own residence, at Mrs. Myrtle's or elsewhere, she would find herself stealthily supported round the waist by Mr. Sparkler's arm. Mr. Sparkler never offered the slightest explanation of this attention, but merely smiled with an air of blundering, contented, good-natured proprietorship, which, in so heavy a gentleman, was ominously expressive. Little Dorrit was at home one day, thinking about Fanny with a heavy heart. They had a room at one end of their drawing-room suite, nearly all irregular bay window, projecting over the street, and commanding all the picturesque life and variety of the Corso both up and down. At three or four o'clock in the afternoon, English time, the view from this window was very bright and peculiar, and Little Dorrit used to sit and muse here, much as she had been used to while away the time in her balcony at Venice. Seated thus one day, she was softly touched on the shoulder, and Fanny said, "'Well, Amy dear,' and took her seat at her side. Their seat was a part of the window. When there was anything in the way of a procession going on, they used to have bright draperies hung out of the window, and used to kneel or sit on this seat and look out at it, leaning on the brilliant colour. But there was no procession that day, and Little Dorrit was rather surprised by Fanny's being at home at that hour, as she was generally out on horseback then. "'Well, Amy,' said Fanny, "'what are you thinking of, little one?' "'I was thinking of you, Fanny. "'No, what a coincidence. "'I declare here's someone else. "'You were not thinking of this someone else too, were you, Amy?' "'Amy had been thinking of this someone else too, "'for it was Mr. Sparkler. "'She did not say so, however, as she gave him her hand. Mr. Sparkler came and sat down on the other side of her, and she felt the fraternal railing come behind her and apparently stretch on to include Fanny. "'Well, my little sister,' said Fanny with a sigh, "'I suppose you know what this means?' "'She's as beautiful as she's doted on,' stammered Mr. Sparkler, "'and there's no nonsense about her. It's arranged.' "'You needn't explain, Edmund,' said Fanny. "'No, my love.' said Mr. Sparkler. "'In short, pet,' proceeded Fanny, "'on the whole we are engaged. "'We must tell Papa about it either tonight or tomorrow "'according to the opportunities. "'Then it's done, and very little more need be said.' "'My dear Fanny,' said Mr. Sparkler, with deference, "'I should like to say a word to Amy.' "'Well, well, say it for goodness' sake,' returned the young lady. "'I am convinced, my dear Amy,' said Mr. Sparkler, that if ever there was a girl, next to your highly endowed and beautiful sister, who had no nonsense about her. We know all about that, Edmund, interposed Miss Fanny. Never mind that. Pray go on to something else besides our having no nonsense about us. Yes, my love, said Mr. Sparkler, and I assure you, Amy, that nothing can be a greater happiness to myself, myself, next to the happiness of being so highly honoured with the choice of a glorious girl who hasn't an atom of "'Pray, Edmund, pray,' interrupted Fanny, with a slight pat of her pretty foot upon the floor. "'My love, you're quite right,' said Mr. Sparkler. "'And I know I have a habit of it. "'What I wished to declare was that nothing could be a greater happiness to myself, "'myself, next to the happiness of being united to preeminently the most glorious of girls, "'than to have the happiness of cultivating the affectionate acquaintance of Amy.' 
I may not myself, said Mr. Sparkler manfully, be up to the mark on some other subjects at a short notice, and I am aware that if you were to poll society, the general opinion would be that I am not, but on the subject of Amy, I am up to the mark. Mr. Sparkler kissed her in witness thereof. A knife and fork and an apartment, proceeded Mr. Sparkler, growing in comparison with his oratorical antecedents quite diffuse, will ever be at Amy's disposal. My governor, I am sure, will always be proud to entertain one whom I so much esteem. And regarding my mother, said Mr. Sparkler, who is a remarkably fine woman with... Edmund, Edmund, cried Miss Fanny as before. With submission, my soul, pleaded Mr. Sparkler. I know I have a habit of it, and I thank you very much, my adorable girl, for taking the trouble to correct it, but my mother is admitted on all sides to be a remarkably fine woman, and she really hasn't any. That may be or may not be, returned Fanny, but pray don't mention it any more. I will not, my love, said Mr. Sparkler. Then, in fact, you have nothing more to say, Edmund, have you? inquired Fanny. So far from it, my adorable girl, answered Mr. Sparkler. I apologise for having said so much. Mr. Sparkler perceived by a kind of inspiration that the question implied that he had better not go. He therefore withdrew the fraternal railing and neatly said that he thought he would, with submission, take his leave. He did not go without being congratulated by Amy as well as she could discharge that office in the flutter and distress of her spirits. When he was gone, she said, Oh, Fanny, Fanny, and turned to her sister in the bright window and fell upon her bosom and cried there. Fanny laughed at first, but soon laid her face against her sister's and cried too a little. It was the last time Fanny ever showed that there was any hidden, suppressed, or conquered feeling in her on the matter. From that hour the way she had chosen lay before her, and she trod it, with her own imperious, self-willed step. Chapter 15 No just cause or impediment why these two persons should not be joined together. Mr. Dorrit, on being informed by his elder daughter that she had accepted matrimonial overtures from Mr. Sparkler, to whom she had plighted her troth, received the communication at once with great dignity and with a large display of parental pride. His dignity dilating with the widened prospect of advantageous ground from which to make acquaintances, and his parental pride from being developed by Miss Fanny's ready sympathy with that great object of his existence. He gave her to understand that her noble ambition found harmonious echoes in his heart, and bestowed his blessing on her as a child brimful of duty and good principle, self-devoted to the aggrandizement of the family name. To Mr. Sparkler, when Miss Fanny permitted him to appear, Mr. Dorrit said he would not disguise that the alliance Mr. Sparkler did him the honour to propose was highly congenial to his feelings. Both as being in unison with the spontaneous affections of his daughter Fanny, and as an opening a family connection of a gratifying nature with Mr. Myrtle, the master spirit of the age. Mrs. Myrtle also, as a leading lady rich in distinction, elegance, grace, and beauty, he mentioned in very laudatory terms. He felt it his duty to remark he was sure a gentleman of Mr. Sparkler's fine sense would interpret him with all delicacy, that he could not consider this proposal definitely determined on until he should have had the privilege of holding some correspondence with Mr. Myrtle, and of ascertaining it to be so far accordant with the views of that eminent gentleman as that his, Mr. Dorrit's daughter, would be received on that footing which her station in life and her dowry and expectations warranted him in requiring that she should maintain in what he trusted he might be allowed, without the appearance of being mercenary, to call the eye of the great world. While saying this, which his character as a gentleman of some little station, and his character as a father, equally demanded of him, he would not be so diplomatic as to conceal that the proposal remained in hopeful abeyance and under conditional acceptance, 
and that he thanked Mr. Sparkler for the compliment rendered to himself and to his family. He concluded with some further and more general observations on the uh, character of an independent gentleman that the um, character of a possibility too partial and admiring parent. To sum the whole up shortly, he received Mr. Sparkler's offer very much as he would have received three or four half-crowns from him in the days that were gone. Mr. Sparkler, finding himself stunned by the words thus heaped upon his inoffensive head, made a brief though pertinent rejoinder, the same being neither more nor less than he had long perceived Miss Fanny to have no nonsense about her, and that he had no doubt of his being all right with his governor. At that point the object of his affections shut him up like a box with a spring lid and sent him away. Proceeding shortly afterwards to pay his respects to the bosom, Mr. Dorrit was received by it with great consideration. Mrs. Myrtle had heard of this affair from Edmund. She had been surprised at first, because she had not thought Edmund a marrying man. Society had not thought Edmund a marrying man. Still, of course, she had seen as a woman, we women did distinctively see these things, Mr. Dorrit, that Edmund had been immensely captivated by Miss Dorrit, and she had openly said that Mr. Dorrit had much to answer for in bringing so charming a girl abroad to turn the heads of his countrymen. "'Have I the honour to conclude, madam,' said Mr. Dorrit, "'that the direction in which Mr. Sparkler's affections have taken is uh, uh, approved of by you?' "'I assure you, Mr. Dorrit,' returned the lady, uh, "'that personally I am charmed.' "'That was gratifying to Mr. Dorrit.' "'Personally,' repeated Mrs. Myrtle, "'charmed.' "'This casual repetition of the word personally,' moved Mr. Dorrit to express his hope that Mr. Myrtle's approval, too, would not be wanting. "'I cannot,' said Mrs. Myrtle, "'take upon myself to answer positively for Mr. Myrtle. Gentlemen, especially gentlemen, who are what society calls capitalists, having their own ideas of these matters. But I should think, merely giving an opinion, Mr. Dorrit, I should think Mr. Myrtle would be upon the whole—' Here she held a review of herself before adding at her leisure— quite charmed. At the mention of gentlemen whom society called capitalists, Mr. Dorrit had coughed, as if some internal demure were breaking out of him. Mrs. Myrtle had observed it, and went on to take up the cue. Though, indeed, Mr. Dorrit, it is scarcely necessary for me to make that remark, except in the mere openness of saying what is uppermost to one whom I so highly regard and with whom I hope I may have the pleasure of being brought into still more agreeable relations. For one cannot but see the great probability of your considering such things from Mr. Myrtle's own point of view, except, indeed, that circumstances have made it Mr. Myrtle's accidental fortune or misfortune to be engaged in business transactions, and that they, however vast, may a little cramp his horizons. I am a very child as to having any notion of business, said Mrs. Myrtle, but I am afraid, Mr. Dorrit, it may have that tendency. This skilful seesaw of Mr. Dorrit and Mrs. Myrtle, so that each of them sent the other up, and each of them sent the other down, and neither had the advantage, acted as a sedative on Mr. Dorrit's cough. He remarked with his utmost politeness that he must beg to protest against it being supposed, even by Mrs. Myrtle, the accomplished and graceful to which compliment she bent herself, that such enterprises as Mr. Myrtle's, apart as they were from the puny undertakings of the rest of men, had any lower tendency than to enlarge and expand the genius in which they were conceived. "'You are generosity itself,' said Mrs. Myrtle in return, smiling her best smile. Uh, "'Let us hope so, but I confess I am almost superstitious in my ideas about business.' Mr. Dorrit threw in another compliment here, to the effect that business, like the time which was precious in it, was made for slaves, and that it was not for Mrs. Myrtle, who ruled all her hearts at her supreme pleasure, to have anything to do with it. Mrs. Myrtle laughed, and conveyed to Mr. Dorrit an idea that the bosom flushed, which was one of her best effects. "'I say so much,' 
she then explained, merely because Mr. Myrtle has always taken the greatest interest in Edmund and has always expressed the strongest desire to advance his prospects. Edmund's public position, I think you know, his private position rests solely with Mr. Myrtle. In my foolish incapacity for business, I assure you I know no more. Mr. Dorrit again expressed, in his own way, the sentiment that business was below the ken of enslavers and enchantresses. He then mentioned his intention, as a gentleman and a parent, of writing to Mr. Myrtle. Mrs. Myrtle concurred with all her heart, or with all her art, which was exactly the same thing, and herself dispatched a preparatory letter by the next post to the eighth wonder of the world. In his epistolary communication, as in his dialogues and discourses on the great question to which it related, Mr. Dorrit surrounded the subject with flourishes, as writing masters embellish copy books and ciphering books, where the titles of elementary rules of arithmetic diverge into swans, eagles, griffins, and other calligraphic recreations, and where the capital letters go out of their minds and bodies into ecstasies of pen and ink. Nevertheless, he did render the purport of his letter sufficiently clear to enable Mr. Myrtle to make a decent pretense of having learnt it from that source. Mr. Myrtle replied to it accordingly. Mr. Dorrit replied to Mr. Myrtle. Mr. Myrtle replied to Mr. Dorrit, and it was soon announced that the corresponding powers had come to a satisfactory understanding. Now, and not before, Miss Fanny burst upon the scene completely arrayed for her new part. Now and not before, she wholly absorbed Mr. Sparkler in her light and shone for both, and twenty more. No longer feeling that want of a defined place and character which had caused her so much trouble, this fair ship began to steer steadily on a shaped course and to swim with a weight and balance that developed her sailing qualities. The preliminaries being so satisfactorily arranged, I think I will now, my dear, said Mr. Dorrit, announce her formally to Mrs. General. Papa, returned Fanny, taking him up short upon that name, I don't see what Mrs. General has got to do with it. My dear, said Mr. Dorrit, it will be an act of courtesy to a, a lady well-bred and refined. Oh, I am sick of Mrs. General's good breeding and refinement, Papa said Fanny. I am tired of Mrs. General. Tired, repeated Mr. Dorrit in reproachful astonishment, of uh, Mrs. General. Quite disgusted with her, Papa, said Fanny. I really don't see what she has to do with my marriage. Let her keep to her own matrimonial projects, if she has any. Fanny, returned Mr. Dorrit, with a grave and weighty slowness upon him, contrasting strongly with his daughter's levity. I beg the favour of your explaining uh, what it is you mean. I mean, Papa, said Fanny, that if Mrs. General should happen to have any matrimonial projects of her own, I dare say they are quite enough to occupy her spare time. And if this she has not, so much the better, but still I don't wish to have the honour of making announcements to her. Permit me to ask you, Fanny, said Mr. Dorrit, why not? Because she can find my engagement out for herself, Papa retorted Fanny. She is watchful enough, I dare say. I think I have seen her so. Let her find it out for herself. If she should not find it out for herself, she will know it when I am married. And I hope you will not consider me wanting in affection for you, Papa, if I say it strikes me that you will be quite enough for Mrs. General. Fanny, returned Mr. Dorrit, I am amazed. I am displeased by this, um, this capricious and unintelligible display of animosity towards a uh, Mrs. General. Do not, if you please, Papa, urged Fanny, call it animosity, because I assure you I do not consider Mrs. General worth my animosity. At this, Mr. Dorrit rose from his chair with a fixed look of severe reproof and remained standing in his dignity before his daughter. His daughter, turning the bracelet on her arm, and now looking at him, and now looking from him, said, Very well, Papa. I am truly sorry if you don't like it, but I can't help it. I am not a child, and I am not Amy, and I must speak. Fanny, gasped Mr. Dorrit, after a majestic silence. 
If I request you to remain here while I formally announce to Mrs. General as an exemplary lady who is hmm, a trusted member of this family, the uh, the change that is contemplated among us, if I uh, not only request it but um, insist upon it. Oh, Papa, Viney broke in with pointed significance. If you make so much of it as that, I have in duty nothing to do but comply. I hope I may have my thoughts upon the subject, however, for I really cannot help it under the circumstances. So Fanny sat down with a meekness which, in the junction of extremes, became defiance, and her father, either not deigning to answer or not knowing what to answer, summoned Mr. Tinkler into his presence. Mrs. General Mr. Tinkler, unused to receive such short orders in connection with the fair varnisher, paused. Mr. Dorrit, seeing the whole Marshal Sea and all its testimonials in the pause, instantly flew at him with, How dare you? What do you mean? I beg your pardon, sir, pleaded Mr. Tinkler. I was wishful to know. You wish to know nothing, sir, cried Mr. Dorrit, highly flushed. Don't tell me you did, uh, you didn't. You are guilty of mockery, sir. I assure you, sir. "'Mr. Tinkler began. "'Don't assure me,' said Mr. Doddett. "'I will not be assured by a domestic. "'You are guilty of mockery. "'You shall leave me, um, the whole establishment shall leave me. "'What are you waiting for?' "'Only for my orders, sir.' "'It's false,' said Mr. Doddett. "'You have your orders. Um, "'My compliments to Mrs. General, "'and I beg the favour of her coming to me, "'if quite convenient, for a few minutes. "'Those are your orders.' In his execution of this mission, Mr. Tinkler perhaps expressed that Mr. Dorrit was in a raging fume. However that was, Mrs. General's skirts were very speedily heard outside coming along, one might almost have said bouncing along, with unusual expedition. Albeit they settled down at the door and swept into the room with their customary coolness. "'Mrs. General,' said Mr. Dorrit, "'take a chair.' Mrs. General, with a graceful curve of acknowledgment, descended into the chair which Mr. Dorrit offered. "'Madam,' pursued that gentleman, "'as you have had the kindness to undertake the um, formation of my daughters, "'and as I am persuaded that nothing nearly affecting them can uh, be indifferent to you.' "'Wholly impossible,' said Mrs. General, in the calmest of ways. "'I therefore wish to announce to you, madam, that my daughter now present—' Mrs. General made a slight inclination of her head to Fanny, who made a very low inclination of her head to Mrs. General, and came loftily upright again, and that my daughter Fanny is uh, contracted to be married to Mr. Sparkler, with whom you are acquainted. Hence, madam, you will be relieved of half your difficult charge, a uh, 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 difficult charge. Mr. Dorrit repeated it with his angry eye on Fanny, but not, I hope, to the um, a diminution of any other portion— direct or indirect, of the footing you have at present the kindness to occupy in my family. Mr. Dorrit, returned Mrs. General, with her gloved hands resting on one another in exemplary repose, is ever considerate and ever but too appreciative of my friendly services. Miss Fanny coughed as much to say, You are right. Miss Dorrit has no doubt exercised the soundest discretion of which the circumstances admitted, and I trust will allow me to offer her my sincere congratulations. When free from the trammels of passion, Mrs. General closed her eyes at the word, as if she could not utter it and see anybody, when occurring with the approbation of near relatives, and when cementing the proud structure of a family edifice, these are usually auspicious events. I trust Miss Dorrit will allow me to offer her my best congratulations. Here Mrs. General stopped and added internally, for the setting of her face, Papa, potatoes, poultry, prunes, and prism. Mr. Dorrit, she superadded aloud, is ever most obliging, and for the attention, and I will add distinction, of having this confidence imparted to me by himself and Miss Dorrit at this early time, I beg to offer the tribute of my thanks. My thanks and my congratulations are equally the meed of Mr. Dorrit and of Miss Dorrit. To me, observed Miss Fanny, they are excessively gratifying, inexpressibly so, 
The relief of finding that you have no objection to make, Mrs. General, quite takes a load off my mind, I am sure. I hardly know what I should have done, said Fanny, if you had interposed any objection, Mrs. General. 